Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, where we speak about personal development and entrepreneurship. This is episode 148. Today, we have with us Mike Berlan. Now, Mike is the founder and CEO of Decode M, a research and analytics firm that decodes data into momentum for its client. Now, Mike is also an author, and today we are talking about his latest book, Maximum Momentum, How to Get It, How to Keep It. Let's listen to the conversation. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. So, Mike, so this book is is amazing. It opened my eyes to a lot of things that are going on in society and in corporate America and in politics as well. So the insight is just amazing. I would like to start a little bit with your background story. Who are you? How do you get started into this world of, of being a pollster? I became a pollster because I knew that I wanted to be a kingmaker and not a king. So right. a pollster provides data, information, and insights that lead to strategy that help a king get elected. But a, um, a kingmaker can work for one king, can work for another king, and another king because the king gets shot, the king can lose an election, and kingmaker goes on. Right, and what brought this uh, ambition towards you? Because this is this is high level thinking right from the start. And you know, most people we just want to have a job. And you, right from the beginning, according to your book, you wanted to be the kingmaker. Yeah, I always knew that I uh, was good at strategy. I understood what made people tick, and I could translate that into actions so that I could help my my kings get the action they wanted, whether to vote for them, to buy their products, or uh, to do business with them. And what was it? Is it the desire to have money or power, influence, or, or the intellectual capacity to play with these chess pieces to put them here and take them out there? Well, you know, um, there's all sorts of different kings out there. So some kings want to be the king of politics. Some want to be the kings of business. But the motivation and the, and the strategies to help them become king are remarkably the same. They all come down to uh, understanding communications and messaging so that it gets to persuasion. Okay, and can you take us a little bit through the journey of how you, from a high school kid, deciding what to do with his life to where you got to be a kingmaker? Well, I was a high school loser. I lost two elections in high school in junior, um, when I was a junior and when I was a senior to be president of the class. And I lost to the same person twice. And that was when I had the insight, why do I want to be somebody who loses elections? I'm just a loser where I can be a kingmaker. And if the king loses, it's not my fault. It's the king's fault. And I move on. And it was a, it was a wonderful moment in my life of true introspection to understand what I was good at and what I didn't like. Okay, but uh, how, how did it happen? I mean, you lost twice to this, uh, I got it from the book, it was a, a talented woman. Yes, Karen. Uh, and Karen. then you, I guess you felt the frustration and the bitterness of losing. You decided that a better strategy was to help other people kings become king or president or whatever, but there's a lot of empty space from that moment and that realization to the work you're doing today. You know, I actually didn't feel frustration or disappointment. I, I felt challenged to understand why people voted the way they did. I knew that my calling was politics. I knew that I had insights on how to behave. And so I went to college uh, to study sociology and understand survey research. I had an internship at one of the top polling companies in New York called Penn and Schoen at the time, who was working for an audacious congressman who wanted to be mayor of New York named Ed Koch, who's very famous uh, here in, in, in New York. And I could apply this, this skills of how to get people to take certain actions, but I needed the technical ability. So I studied statistics. I studied uh, sociology, uh, which is the study of societies, so that I could have the technical skills and the uh, emotional skills that I already had. 
Okay, so what, you got a job but then after that? Tell us some of those ex yeah. early experiences that, that happened because, uh, of course, you started maybe out of nowhere as somebody's helper or, or, or in some research room, and now you are you are an author, you have written several books, you are uh, you are running this corporation, so, yeah. I have one of the, I have one of the um, most incredible stories. I started off as an intern, Doing, uh, I was a data analyst doing cross tabulations on a big mainframe computer, analyzing survey results. But I, my, I was, I was an apprentice, or and I was an intern for one of the most important pollsters of our time, uh, a gentleman named Mark Penn, who took me under his wing and taught me everything. And within two years, I was able to understand the innovation, the creativity the mindset, the technical skills, and I was ready to be on my own. I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to stay. I was ready for that transformation to go from intern to uh, project manager to project leader all within a couple of years. I was, I had momentum from an early age transforming my career all the way through. Okay, and can you um, can you tell us about some of the campaigns that you work with, uh, with either pol political or corporate? Oh well, I, I've been very fortunate. I, I worked on the most fun campaigns. I worked um, for Ross Perot in 1992. I worked for Bill Clinton. I worked for Michael Bloomberg. I, I worked for Facebook. I worked for BlackBerry. I worked for. Um, Coca-Cola. I've really worked on a wide variety of clients, always following my passion. It's very lucky in life to be able to work for clients that you're genuinely interested in. And I've always had that ability. Okay, so you just mentioned uh, BlackBerry. Can you more or less uh, recall the experience of working for BlackBerry? What is it? How do you help them I guess no succeed because I did, they didn't <laughs> succeed. Well, I I helped them succeed. They they helped themselves not succeed. It's a great king story. Um, I wrote an article in 2004 predicting what would be hot in the next year, and there were two companies that were at the top of the list. One was Google, and one was BlackBerry. And BlackBerry saw the article. And they wanted to find out why they were going to be a hot item. At that point, BlackBerry was just a um, uh, w w was just really a pager that some business executives had that would then push email to them. And their aspiration was to go from just being a business product to a consumer product. So we took BlackBerry from a very niche product up in Canada. Um, and took them worldwide to be one of the uh, most highly respected and used brands. But like all kings, sometimes they make bad decisions. And as the, as the market evolved and Android entered the market and Apple entered the market, BlackBerry didn't stay current. And I remember having a fight with the CEO because he didn't want to put a camera into the BlackBerry device. And I said, no, people will use the camera. And he said, what will they use it for? And I said, well, they'll take photos. And he said, not possible. They're not going to do that. And that was the beginning of the end of BlackBerry because they lost the momentum because they refused to transform. Right. I see. Okay. So you are working on all these uh, exciting campaigns and all these interesting politicians. And then you decided to sit down and become an author. I mean, I has, I see here that you have uh, different books, uh, What Makes You Tick, and you also have The Fat Burning Machine. So can you tell us about your aspiration to become a writer? You know, what got that started? I was always passionate about writing, it, and it comes with the same skill of advising people. So I, my first book, What Makes You Take How Successful People Do It and What Can You Learn From That, was I was working with amazing clients who were achieving uh, in, uh, incredible um, goals and building great companies, and I wanted to share their stories. And so I interviewed them for the book. And I shared their. I, I shared uh, what. At what point did they know what they were going to do? What was the introspection? Uh, 
process and then how did they achieve it so that other people could learn from them. The second book I wrote was called How to Become a Fat Burning Machine, which was really, again, something I was very curious about. I wasn't a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a trainer. But I was a guy who had gained a pound a week, a pound a week, a pound a, uh, a year since the time I was 21 years old, which in my 20s meant I gained a few pounds. In my 30s, I had gained you know 15 pounds. But by the time I was in my 40s, I'd gained 30 pounds and my doctor wanted to put me on um, cholesterol reducing medicine. And I thought there might, must be a better way. So taking the skills that I learned as a researcher, I found that, that I had something called metabolic syndrome, which many people, when you sort of gain weight around the middle, and I uh, worked on a diet to solve it. And that turned out to be a best-selling book. And wow. um, yeah, yeah, and it was, no. what? Not only you work on a diet, but I know that you also do cycling. I see some photos of you doing on top of your horse, I mean, your bicycle. Yes, I am uh, a three-time uh, Ironman, which, you know, growing up, I uh, especially being overweight, I would have never thought that it was possible to become an Ironman. It was always a goal that was very uh, aspirational to swim two and a half miles, to bike 112 and run a marathon in the same day. And I made it my goal that once I lost the weight and I lost 77 pounds, that then I would do the Ironman. And I ended up doing three of them in Hawaii and when it was a 110 degree uh, heat index. Wow, amazing. Okay, so uh, then you decide to write this book, Maximum Momentum. What was the inspiration for this book? I wanted to quantify cultural relevancy. Being a pollster, I always asked questions and had answers, which gave me limited data. As more data became available, I realized that it, the trick wasn't collecting data, it was analyzing data and decoding it. So I became a decoder and I created something called M factor, which is a metric to analyze momentum. You have an amazing, very short story, but, but I mean, it just piqued my curiosity. Uh, your wife, Marcela, was being caged by the Venezuelan police. Uh, uh, was she that pretty or was she that smart? Uh, my wife is pretty smart and she is a top international a presidential pollster who had data that suggested that uh, Chavez hadn't won the election and that the election had been stolen and it was on her laptop and the police were chasing her from building to building. So I was watching a football game and I got a call from Marcella and I thought she was calling to say hello and wish me um, uh, have a good night. And she basically said she's being chased by the police and uh, she might get put in jail, and she gave me the information to bill her client. Wow. <laughs> Business first, eh? The, the Business fee, before love. <laughs> uh, the, the, one of the lessons I learned at the internship is that the fee is the key. Everything else is, is an irrelevancy. Okay, wow, amazing. Okay, so tell us a little bit more uh, about the book. What else can we, other than the amazing story of your wife, Marcella, what else can we learn from your book? Well, one of the most important insights is that there are actually five momentum drivers and there's polarization, um, uh, innovation, uh, sticky disruption and social impact. And these five drivers are, are can tell you um, uh, are the pillars of momentum and really are the essential factors that you need. So uh, polarization means having a strong point of view. Innovation means creating something new. Stickiness means you have to be memorable in an unexpected way. Disruption means changing um, the game in some way. Don't do business as usual. And social impact, connecting to a larger purpose. And you have to have all five drivers to have momentum. Okay, and you, you talk a lot about politics in your book. And of course, your book was uh, written right before the... 
the COVID-19 uh, fiasco that we are living right now. Yes. Uh, you also uh, mentioned, uh, well, going a little bit into politics, that uh, President Trump had a lot of momentum. I wonder if his momentum has been disrupted by this uh, COVID-19 era, or does he still has it? Momentum is interesting in that disruption and transformation are natural parts of momentum. So the question for Trump, disruption is good for him. The question is, will he transform the right way? He was a um, effective at growing the economy. Americans felt, while they didn't like him personally and maybe didn't like all of his style, they appreciated what they had done to grow the economy. We had record low unemployment. The stock market was at record highs. And so, while they didn't like every aspect about him, they liked him enough. Now he has to transform from a president who is uh, building a great economy to now solving a pandemic. Now, so can he transform and become that great president who's going to lead us through a crisis? And right now, despite what you might read in the newspaper, it's too early to tell. Americans are wondering, are they? Are we going to open up and get back to that great economic place that we were? Or are we going to stay shut down and will the economy be at levels of the Great Recession and the Depression, actually? If that's the case, I don't know if he'll be pre President Trump next year. If, right. if the economy does come back, I think um, chances are it will be a good recovery and Trump will have a chance. And are we going to open up? You know, understanding um, when we're going to open up is not my area of expertise. Right. There are doctors and there are, you know, our, our, our governmental leaders who will make that decision. How we open up is something that I think is important. We are not going to go back to yesterday. We are going to tomorrow, which will be a very different world. Right. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of system systemic shift in American society. There are things that are happening today that we could have never imagined 20, 30 years ago. For example, now gay couples are allowed to get married, which if you were going to say that at 20 or 30 years ago, people would have think you are crazy. Uh, yeah. People now are consuming marijuana and in many states, Little. same thing. If you were uh, tell that to someone 20 years ago, they would probably put you in jail. Now, uh, I, is there is, I'm I'm a vegan, <laughs> so I don't eat meat, and I see these companies uh, beyond meat and impossible meats. I wonder if this is some new new thing that is taking America uh, over, or is not? If it, is it just a fad? No, I, I think uh, impossible meats, legalized marijuana, um, uh, gay marriage is, is all part of a trend of the momentum of a more open-minded, a more progressive, and a more tolerant society. It, it comes with social media and the ability to connect in ways that we never could. It's not just happening in America. It really is happening all over the world that some societal changes are happening that make us more tolerant of our differences and being able to accept things. Um, on the other side, we have people who are wanting to shut the borders. We have nationalism at a record rate. We have some uh, racial intolerance uh, that we all exist. I, I was going to say in Europe, but I think it exists around the world. So the ability for us to communicate and to connect has had many positive benefits and we can see the momentum. But there have been other things that also have allowed some of the um, negative aspects to happen. And so one thing I'll tell you about momentum, it doesn't have a moral compass. It doesn't always go in, uh, it's, it's not always positive. You can have momentum for bad issues. You can have momentum for inequality. You can have uh, m bad momentum for equal pay. There's So there's the e equality. So there's issues that still need to be resolved. But I think we're on the right track in many ways. 
Okay. Uh, uh, here's another question uh, uh, regards momentum and the changes of society. I'm 53 years old. When I was a teenager, the main thing for a teenager like me was to have a brand new car with big stereo woofers and the, the big tires and all this and that. And nowadays, uh, people don't give a hoot about cars. Right. Uh, they they uh, they take Uber, and I think the thing that people pay attention to uh, right now is their smartphones, their yeah. Apple Watch, and whatever. So, uh, is the car industry in our uh, in, in its way to death? Well, when I'm 52, so we're almost the same age. Our, when we had those cars, it allowed us. Um, first of all, it was a huge symbol of our independence. It allowed us to express ourselves and um, to, you know, our cars told a little bit about who we are. Now, kids have their social media, they have their smartphones, and that's how they can express themselves. In terms of the future of cars, um, cars will always be with us. Uh, cars are, are, are part of society, but with, with ride sharing and other types, we can share our cars and we don't all have to have our cars. Cars have become more functional of getting you from place A to place B. And that self-expression now can happen in other places. I see. Okay, uh, last question. So your book, uh, I consider your book something like high level thinking, uh, how society is behaving, how corporations are transforming themselves. But I wonder how can the average Joe Blow or the small business take the knowledge in your book and apply them to their own situation? Well, first, it starts off with a very simple question. Are your best days ahead or behind? And easy, uh, interesting to ask, easy to answer, hard to be truthful. And so if, as you ask yourself that question, if your best days are behind, what are the transformations that you're going to make to, to build momentum, to get them to be ahead? And I've had to face that question many times in my career. And the answer has been no. Whether it was when I was a pollster and I realized that polling data that I was collecting wasn't enough, that there were many other uh, data sources that were available. Was it when I was 75 pounds overweight and I was gonna have to take control of my health? And so as business people, we have to ask ourselves every day, are our best days ahead and be willing to make changes if they're not. Wow, amazing. Okay, I'm going to apply that to my own life. Uh, one last question. Uh, tell us where followers can, first of all, find your book and what can they expect to find in your website? Well, uh, COVID-19 has made it very easy to find my book. It's called Maximum Momentum and it's available on Amazon.com because all the other local bookstores are shut down. Easy to find. And tragic that all the bookstores are shut down. Oh, wow. our, our website is decodem.com, D E C O D E hyphen M.com. And my personal website is mikeburland.com. Okay, I will put all that in the show notes. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. This has been amazing, illuminating, and I'm sure the listeners will enjoy it as well. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure.